All right. Yay. Finally. I get through all the technical issues. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Michaud, and I'm here to present about Perl 6. Uh, to give it a little overview of what I plan to cover, first of all, a little bit of the history of Perl 6 and uh, some of its design decisions, um, some of the highlights about Perl 6. Uh, some information about the various Perl 6 implementations that are available and a little bit about their status and how they work. Um, a lot of detailed information about uh, what we call Recudo Perl, which is the Perl 6 implementation for Parrot, and I'll explain what all of that is here in a little bit. Um, the status of that, and uh, then things that are, you can look forward to that are coming up next. First of all, I'd like to uh, start my presentation by thanking my various sponsors. These are people who actually give me enough money so that I can work on this stuff and uh, my wife doesn't complain too loudly. Um, so that includes the Mozilla Foundation, NLNet, and the Pearl Foundation. And uh, there's a space for sale if anybody else would like to, uh, to add for that. So uh, how many people in here know Pearl? All right. How many people in here know Pearl 6? So, just a bit of the history of Perl. I, I made this for a, a somewhat general audience, although we will get into some technical stuff as well. Um, Perl, of course, is one of the most popular scripting languages. Used to be you could say it was the most popular scripting language, but uh, there's a few others that are kind of catching up with that. It's created by Larry Walls, powerful and expressive. And when people ask me what, why, why I'm interested in Perl, I go back to a quote that Larry, oh, it's also known as the duct tape of the internet. I always go back to a quote that Larry put together a long time ago. Somebody, or he asked rhetorically, he's very into Eastern philosophy, he said, what is the sound of pearl? And pearl is the sound of a wall that no longer has a head beating against it. So if you're not an English speaker, you don't know what that means. You know how when you're programming, you know, you sometimes just want to go, pearl means you no longer have to do that. That's what's wonderful about Perl. However, as wonderful as Perl is, it does have some drawbacks. That's why other languages, other scripting languages are becoming more popular. Uh, for one thing, it does have a fairly steep learning curve. Um, for somebody who is new to programming, Perl can be very intimidating. Um, the syntax can be very difficult. Uh, many people say that it looks like modem line noise. And uh, some of the computing concepts that were added to the latest version of Perl, they were just kind of stuck onto the language. The language was re never really designed with those in mind. And that includes even things like uh, classes and objects, which of course is not a new concept, but they were just kind of added into the Perl language in a way that kind of made it work without destroying too much of what had gone before. So Perl 6 is basically a complete language redesign. And the idea behind Perl 6 was to keep the basic principles of Perl, the things that make Perl great, keep those in there, those basic design philosophies. But redesign a language such that you keep all of those wonderful philosophies, but that it all makes sense. And secondly, or lastly, get rid of all the mistakes that may have been there. As uh, the design team likes to say, this is what they call second system syndrome done right. Whenever you invent a system, there's always a tendency to want to go back and do it again. And when you go and do it again, you make even new mistakes. So this is our chance to try and do it again without making all the new mistakes. Uh, the Perl 6 definition was a community-based effort. Uh, Larry Wall said he wanted the community to, to provide a lot of the input about what needed to change in the language to create Perl 6. Uh, a long process then ensued, and the specification is now available at this particular um, website. You can go and see the specs and the design documents. They're, they're commonly known as the synopses. And uh, if you know Perl, they're fairly readable. And they are uh, somewhat uh, amazing to look at. It's an evolving work and it's been worked on since 2001. And so everybody sits there and they say, man, seven years. Can't y'all get it done yet? I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So changes from Perl 5. This is some of them. You can see the list scrolls off the bottom of the screen, so we'll have to kind of look at that. Uh, the major changes are it has a cleaner, more regular syntax to hopefully make it easier for people to read and understand and to use. Now that said, it still looks like Perl. Nobody will mistake this for a Python program or a Ruby program. It still looks like Perl, but 
it's, it doesn't have a lot of the funny oddities that used to be there in Perl 5. We get rid of the memorized lists. In Perl 5, you had to remember certain situations where you would do one thing in one situation, but you wouldn't do it in another situation. We try to get rid of those and make everything the same um, as explicit. T strong typing, has Unicode support, has parameter lists, named arguments, operator adverbs, classes and prototype-based object systems, has an extensible grammar, Subroutine overloading, operator overloading, user definable operators, and you can use Unicode characters for your operators. Named regular expressions and grammars. Page two. Multi method dispatch, macros that are actually written in Perl, no more source filters. List comprehensions, hyper operators, blah, 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 blah. Now, to try and tell you all the differences between Perl 6 and Perl 5, I can't do in 45 minutes. In fact, every year at the Open Source O'Reilly Open Source Convention that's held in July in Portland, Oregon, uh, Larry Wall and usually Damian Conway will get together to describe what has changed in Perl 6 from pre Perl 6 of the previous year. And they can't even do that part in 45 minutes. So to try and describe everything in Perl 6 over Perl 5 in 45 minutes, I can't do it. So I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to pick some of the highlights that I think will interest people. If you want to see the full details, see, look at the synopses. Okay, so first of all, I said it has a more consistent syntax. Um, if you read Perl 5 code, this should make real good sense to you. So of course, uh, at sign A, we're creating an array. But if you wanted to access the elements of an array in Perl 5, then the at sign A became a dollar sign. And that always confuses people. In Perl 6, we've gotten rid of that. Whatever your variable name is, it stays the same no matter how you use it. Okay, so that's uh, much more consistent. Same thing is true for hashes with the percent sign. If you want to get it in a hash element, it's always percent something. It's not, uh, it's not uh, changing to a dollar sign. Uh, we have consistent data type prefixes. The plus, uh, squiggle, the tilde, and the question mark are consistently used to mean numeric, string or Boolean context. So anytime you put a plus sign in front of something, that means you want its numeric value. If you put a squiggle in front of it, that means you want its string value. And if you put a question mark in front of it, that means you're looking for a Boolean of some sort. So the bitwise or operators now have three different forms. You can have a numeric bitwise or, a um, string bitwise or, or a Boolean bitwise or. In Perl 5, we had just a few basic data types, hash, array, scalar, reference, a few others, subroutine. These are some of the built-in data types in Perl 6 that are defined, large set. So some nice things about Perl 6 over Perl 5, just continuing on. We have what are called chained operators. In Perl 5, if you wanted to see if something was within a range of two numbers, and this is true in most other languages, you had to break it up and repeat it twice. So this tests to make sure that dollar sign $x is between 0 and 10. Um, so you would say if 0 is less than or equal to dollar sign $x, and if dollar sign $x is less than 10. And we've become so used to doing this as programmers that you often forget that for new people that doesn't, that's not the intuitive way to do it. So in Perl 6, you actually write it this way. And it means exactly the same thing. So this tests simultaneously that dollar sign $x is, is uh, um, greater than or equal to 0 and is less than 10. And it only evaluates dollar sign $x once. Now, this is kind of a simple example. We can go a little bit longer. And unfortunately, this one scrolls off the side of my screen here because I'm, uh, I'm not at full resolution. But if um, this is testing, if roll one, uh, if 1 is less than or equal to roll 1 and um, roll 1 is less than or equal to 6, and roll one is equal to roll two, then you roll doubles, like if you were rolling a, a pair of dice, right? In Perl six, we write this as the following. If one is less than or equal to roll one, and that's equal to roll two, and that's less than or equal to six, you do the same thing. So you get rid of a lot of those ampersands that were there. Junctions. How many people are familiar with Damian Conway's superpositions module, or his quantum physics module? Well, it's built into Perl 6. That's Damien's contribution. But we call them junctions. 
a junction is a value that actually consists of multiple values. Now, it's not an array. It's actually still a scalar, but that scalar simultaneously holds multiple values. So the way that we, one way to represent junctions is by using the vertical bar. So this says we have a value that is one or two or three, and it holds all three of those values at the same time. And if we add four to that, then we get back a value that is five or six or seven. And we don't have to decide which one it is until we do something later. But what that allows us to do is to make our programs even shorter. So instead of having to do our test earlier that a role was between one and six, we can say, unless role is any of the values one through six, do this. Or we can say, if the role is a one or a two or a three, do this. You just write it out that way directly. Or you can even do longer tests. If none of the elements in A are equal to this element, do this. Previously in Perl 5, you'd have to write a loop to go through that, or a grep, or something that would actually go through all of the elements and test them for you. In Perl 6, it's just very natural. If none of the elements in A are equal to this element, do something. That's, re that's pretty nice about junctions. One piece that I don't have in my slide here is that junctions are also, or they can be, automatically threading. That it will do the operation in parallel, and if you have a multiprocessor type environment, then it can actually fork it out. We haven't implemented that part, but that's the idea, is that it would automatically thread. Perl 6 has what are called hyper operators. Most of the operators have hyper forms of them. So an example, um, in uh, Perl 5, if you wanted to take all of the elements of array A and B and add them together to pairwise to form C, then you could write a little loop to do it. In Perl 6, we have this thing called the hyper operator. It uses the uh, French chevrons or the French quotes, the French angle brackets, which are the double ones. And you put those around an operator, and that says you want it to be hyperized. You want it to do something on an array of elements instead of on a single element. And so if we want to pairwise add all of the elements of A with B and stick that in C, you just write that line there. Or if you wanted to increment all of the elements of an array, you can do it with increment. Take all of the elements in the array x, y, z and add one to them. Cool. The, uh, by the way, I should say, my role in Perl 6 is I'm what's called the Perl 6 pumpkin. I'm the one that's in charge of writing a compiler. I do not do the language design. So anything you don't like about the language, that's not my fault. I, I, don't, I don't write the lang I don't design the language, I'm just responsible for implementing it. Perl 6 has what are called reduction operators. Okay, these are kind of like the hyper operators, but they do something different. Any infix operator, an infix operator is an operator that has two operands. Any infix operator can be turned into what's called a reduction operator, where it works on an entire list. So this is saying, working on infix plus, that uh, we want to take the elements one, two, and three and pairwise add them together and give me the result. So this is a shorthand for saying sum all the elements of a list. So here's a few more examples. Uh, this one here, sum all the elements of A and stick it in sum. Or if you wanted to multiply them all together, you can multiply them all together and put them in product. If you want to compute the factorial, create a range from one to n and multiply all those together. If you want to make sure that all of the elements are in increasing order, that is that they're sorted and that there are no uh, duplicates, then you can say pairwise test every element of A to make sure that the preceding element is less than the following element. And it will be false if that's not true. If you want to find the minimum element of a list, there's actually a min, min operator in Perl 6. So you can say check all the elements of A and give me the smallest and do it that way. In Perl 6, I mentioned you can define your own operators. So if you don't like the several hundred operators that Perl 6 gives you, you can create your own. So if you want to have that a exclamation point after a value means take or make the factorial of, you can define it. This says define the exclamation point coming after a value, after an integer value, and makes the factorial definition. And that just adds it directly into the language. Similarly, if you wanted to have 
the plus or minus operator, that's a Unicode character, mean give me a value that is simultaneously the positive and negative version of the value, then that will do that. You can use any sequence of characters as an operator token. It doesn't have to be just symbols. So here I've said create a new operator called uh, parentheses C close parentheses, which is of course the uh, way to designate copyright. And so if you have a copyright, it takes two arguments and it will give you back a string that says the first argument is copyright by and then the second uh, argument. You could actually write somebody's name, parent C, close parent, and then uh, a date and it would give you back a string that is what I just put there. Um, in Perl 6, we actually have real formal parameters uh, as opposed to signatures. So you can actually say, I want to declare a function and it takes three parameters called X, Y, and Z. So that's built in. Now if you want to do it the old way with the at sign underscore, you can still do that. That's not hard to do. But uh, this allows us to do uh, uh, type checking um, and a variety of things. And so we also can do explicit typing. We can say, I want to have a sub where the first argument has to be an animal, the second argument has to be a dog, and the third argument can be anything. We can also do optional parameters. Um, here we have a function. The first parameter x is required. The second parameter y is optional. The third parameter z is optional and defaults to three if it's not given. We can do named parameters in addition to positional parameters. And that's done with the colons. So this says I want to create a subroutine called formalize. Its first required parameter is called text. And there are two named parameters, one called case and one called justify, that can be passed in. And they're optional. We don't have to give them, but we can add them. And that gives us a number of different ways to call this particular function. For example, we can call it and pass a pair. And this says that when that function is called, the dollar sign case variable will have the value upper. Or we can do it using a pair notation like this, colon justify with the parentheses and do that. Or we can do it like this, where we say we want case to be upper, upper, and we want justify to be left. And there's only about 12 other ways to do it um, there. And I think I'm underestimating at 12. There's just a ton of ways to be able to call that particular function and have all the arguments appear in the right place. Uh, Perl 6 has something called a smart match. How many of you like regular expressions in Perl 5? How many of you liked Perl regular expressions in Perl 4? That's where I got started. <laughs> when I first saw regular expressions, they solved so many problems for me. Um, and just to give an idea of what happened with Perl 6, um, the way I got involved in all of this is uh, in 2004, the Perl 6 design team put out a call to the community and said, we're looking for somebody to be the compiler pumpkin. Hopefully somebody who has a lot of time on their hands. Um, and I had just uh, left my position at, um, as a professor to go on sabbatical. And I didn't have anything planned for the sabbatical. So I said, I'll have a lot of time on my hands. Maybe I'll do this. And they turned around and they said, great, you're it. And I went and looked at the regular expression syntax for Perl 6. And I said, oh my god, who's going to implement that? And then I realized, oh, that's me. Anyway, in Perl 5, the, um, the, what was the uh, equal squiggle operator becomes tilde tilde. And it's called a smart match. And that's what we use for regular expression matching. Right? So this is checking to see if dollar sign $x contains the letters msg followed by a sequence of digit followed by dot txt. And I'll explain the syntax here in a little bit. But that's just doing a, a good old regular expression match. However, you can use smart match with things other than regular expressions. So you can do a smart match between a scalar and a type. And this basically does an is a test. Is spot a dog? Or you can do a smart match between two arrays. And that makes sure that the two arrays are identical, that they have identical values. Or you can do an array and a pattern. And this says, which of the elements in A match that pattern? Now I'm actually test that. Or you can test for a range. You can say, is this value inside of this range given by that? And there's a whole bunch of other things. If you go and look at the smart match operator, it basically, you look at it and you say, man, this thing does everything. And that sounds a lot like Perl. 
But um, the smart match is really, really nice for being able to do all sorts of different comparisons. It gives Perl 6 a lot of the do what I mean context that Perl 5 had. Perl 6 has a switch statement, but we don't call it switch. It's now called given and when, and there's a reason for that. There, there's a strong reason for that because it does more than what the traditional switch in case does. Okay? So the, tr the typical syntax is give an expression, and then you say when expression, when expression, default, right? And so what we're doing is we're take the first expression, test it against this one, if so, do this. Otherwise, test against this expression, if so, do this. Otherwise, do this. However, that when part is not just a simple comparison. It's a smart match. So all of the different combinations of smart match that I just give get uh, gets there. So given sets a topic for the enclosing block, and the when keyword smart matches its expression against the current topic. And if it's true, if the smart match actually matches, then it executes the block and leaves the outer and leaves the uh, outer block. And if it's not true, it just continues on to the next statement. So you can do something like this: given a variable x y z, when it is it, when it is exactly the string spot, do this. Otherwise, if it contains the string spot in it somewhere, but is not exactly that, do this. Otherwise, if XYZ is really a dog of some sort, do this. Otherwise, if XYZ is one of the elements inside of the cat's array, do this. Otherwise, if XYZ does not appear in the ABC array, do this. Otherwise, do this. So you can do all those tests as a given when statement or a switch statement. How many people want to write that in Perl 5? That would, take, that would take quite a bit of code. The when statement is not limited to working inside of a given. It'll work inside of any construct that sets a topic. So you can also do it inside of a loop. So this is looping through all of the elements of an array. We'll print out what element we have. And then we do this switch statement as part of the array. And so for each element in this loop, we're going to test it against each one of these conditions and do the appropriate thing. OK, regular expressions. The regular expression syntax is greatly improved. I already mentioned that when I went through and looked at it, I said, wow, this is really amazing. And then I said, oh, gee, you know, I'm the one that gets to write this, apparently. Um, but in order to get rid of a lot of the things that people had to memorize inside of regular expressions, some things have been changed to make them more regular. Uh, first of all, all punctuation inside of a regular expression is what we call metasyntactic, which means anything that's not a letter or a digit um, has a special meaning, either reserved or actual, in a regular expression. So if you want to match something that's not a letter or a digit, then you have to use quotes around it, or otherwise quote it with a backslash. Um, using quotes for our literals makes a lot of things easier. Now, you only have to use quotes if you're going to use something that's not a letter. So here where I said MSG, um, I could omit the quotes there, and it would mean the same thing. But this says I want to match something that has the letters MSG followed by a sequence of one or more digits followed by .txt. So that's how the regular expression works. Another change in regular expressions is that um, we have a, we've, we've taken the brackets away from the character class uh, match, and we now use it for non-capturing groups. In Perl 5, many people don't know this, but that used to be the parents, uh, parent question mark colon sequence. And that's really a pain to write. And so um, now we can do it in, in non-capturing groups with just the brackets. So this says we want to match either the word Alex or a B followed by one or more E's or a C one or more C's. We can now name our regular expressions. And you can name captures within a regular expression. Um, the way to do that is by using the keyword regex. This says we want to define a new regular expression. We want to call it number. And we're going to define our numbers as being a set of one or more digits, optionally followed by a decimal point and, and more digits after that. And of course, we could make that much more complex. But then, later, whenever we want to use that regular expression inside of another expression, we no longer have to repeat it. We just put it in angle brackets. 
And so this is saying, I want to take dollar sign $A, and I want to extract a number out of it, where number was that previously defined regular expression. You can combine them. So here I can say a sigil is any one of these characters. An identifier is an, alpha, is an alphabetic character or an underscore followed by one or more word characters. That should be a zero. Oops. Um, a name is an identifier followed by optionally by zero or more double colons and more identifiers. And you can see each one refers to something that's defined somewhere else. And so a variable is a sigil followed by a name. In addition to regular expressions, we have things called tokens and rules. If you're familiar with compiler and language design, then all of this starts to look really familiar because tokens and rules and uh, stuff are the things we use to define languages. So a token is a regular expression, but it turns off all the backtracking. And that makes it really fast for writing lexical analyzers. Um, because um, we don't have to, we're not going to try and backtrack in the expression. We just want to match whatever we can and stop. And so uh, token is a special type of regex that turns off the backtracking. And then rule is a token, which means no backtracking. But now the spaces inside of the expression mean something. And so this means, this rule says we're looking for a keyword if, followed by something that matches an expression, followed by a block. And the spaces that are here actually correspond to spaces in the input so that it'll match zero or more or one or more spaces in a smart way. So we don't have to worry about putting a lot of backslash s stars in there to say match spaces here if they show up. It just does the right thing. And then of course we can combine all of these and create what's called a grammar. And this is actual Perl 6 code, grammar is a keyword. It's just like a class, except instead of methods we have tokens, regexes, and rules. But uh, this just kind of gives an idea of what a grammar might look like for a simple language. Some other features of Perl 6 of note, but due to time constraints, I'm not going to try and cover them here. We have things called feed operators, gather and take, try and catch. Hyper, um, hyper is actually a keyword that means do the following in parallel. Um, cross and zip operators to combine lists, inline comments, a whole bunch more stuff. Okay, so that's Perl 6. Um, I would take questions at this point, but I'm going to run short on time, and I'm sure there's tons of them, so uh, I'll push that to the end. So Perl 6 implementations. Great, we have this wonderful language. How can anybody actually use it? Um, if you look at Perl 5, there's really just one major implementation of Perl 5, and it's called Perl 5, of all things. In Perl 6, the decision was made that Perl six should be a language specification, but not necessarily a single implementation. And so there could be multiple implementations, and there's good reasons for doing that. And people say, well, why would you want to do that? And, and the answer is, well, how many implementations of C compilers are there? Right? There's lots of them. And how many implementations of other language translators are there? There's lots of them. And so having everything tied to a single implementation is not necessarily a good design principle. So there's multiple implementations, and any implementation that passes the official test suite is Perl 6. You can call itself Perl 6. So the current implementations that are out there, the one that I work on is Perl 6 on Parrot. Uh, in January, we decided to call this Rakuto Perl. I'll explain the name here in a little bit. Um, the one that has the most features of Perl 6 implemented is called Pugs. It's written in Haskell. and um, and so it's the one, if you really want to play with a lot of the esoteric features, then you'll want to use Pugs. But development on Pugs has stalled quite a bit over the past year. And uh, so um, we expect Rakuto Perl to uh, catch up pretty quickly. There's also an implementation that was being done to try and implement Perl 6 on top of Perl 5 using the Pugs translation. And that's got some effort behind it, but it seems to have stalled a little bit as well. Uh, there's a version of Perl 6 called Kind of Perl 6 which is an attempt to write a complete Perl 6 system using only Perl 6. And uh, that's, uh, that's going along pretty well. And then the most recent one by Daniel Rosso is uh, um, SMOP, which has multiple meanings, just like Perl means lots of different things. Uh, SMOP has multi multiple ones. And it's an, a, an, a, an attempt 
to try and write a Perl 6 engine purely in C without like a virtual machine underneath it. Okay, so, can I skip a slide? No, I got it, okay. So, what is Parrot? Um, Parrot is a virtual machine that's designed to efficiently compile and execute bytecode for dynamic languages. One of the things that early came out when Perl 6 was being developed is um, they realized that they would probably need a new runtime engine underneath it, that the Perl 5 runtime engine wasn't really going to work for what they wanted to do. And they said, instead of writing one just for Perl 6, let's do it for a whole host of dynamic languages, things like Python and Tickle and um, nowadays, of course, Ruby and JavaScript and the like. Let's try and come up with an en engine that will do all of these. And so that's what Parrot is, is for. Um, it's the target for Recuda Perl, and it's already usable for a variety of languages, such as Perl 6, TCL, um, Perl 1. We have an implementation of Perl 1. We actually passed the Perl 1 test suite. Um, we have an implementation called Piney. It implements Python. It's still a bit new, but we do have Python programs running on top of Parrot. Um, there's a PHP implementation, there's a Lua implementation, there's a LOL cats uh, code implementation, we have Lisp, APL, a variety of other languages um, that are being implemented on top of Parrot. Now, one of the nice things about this and one of the goals of this effort is that when we have all of these languages sharing the same runtime, they can actually communicate with each other and, and you can have, for example, your Python program call a Perl library or vice versa, or to be able to embed Perl code within your Python program or vice versa. And so um, we, we're, at, we're fairly confident that we're going to be able to achieve this uh, the way that the system is designed. I was skeptical at first when I first heard about it, but I said, yeah, we'll try and see where we go. And, and like many things about Perl 6, when I first look at them, it's like, there's no way this can work. But as we keep plugging away at it, it's like, oh, we can actually do this. So some of the goals for Parrot Things that dynamic languages typically need. Um, memory management, everybody's gotta have a garbage collector. Why don't we all share the same really good garbage collector? Um, regular expression support. How many languages don't have regular expressions these days? So Parrot has a regular expression engine built in that understands a lot of the different syntaxes and can actually do it. Um, object support is built into the runtime engine. Um, threads, native calling interface, just-in-time compilation, introspection, language operability, and the big thing that Parrot brings right now is some really powerful tools for implementing language translators. So that's what I'm gonna show uh, briefly next. Uh, collectively, it's known as the Parrot Compiler Toolkit. It's a set of tools for creating compilers and programs in Parrot. And with this toolkit, I'm gonna show you how we actually create compilers under Parrot and how the Perl 6 compiler is being built. There's a variety of components to it. Um, there's a thing called the parser gram grammar engine. It builds parsers. If you're used to thinking of, in terms of Lex and Yak in Parrot, we t use the Parrot grammar engine. We have a Parrot abstract syntax tree. This is a representation, an abstract representation of the semantics of the program. We have a, a special purpose language called Not Quite Perl. And what this is, is a, it's a very simple form of Perl 6 that you can use to write programs for Parrot. And then we have a generic HLL compiler object that provides a generic interface for high-level language compilers. Now, the interesting thing about most of these components is that to use them, you write your code in Perl 6. There's a, an assembly language that you can also use in Parrot, but most of the guts of the compiler is actually being written using Perl 6 syntax. And that includes the Perl 6 compiler itself. So to create a compiler, you define a grammar, you define actions, you create an HLL compiler object, you create the functions and libraries specific for your particular language, you debug, and all is wonderful. So let's look at parsing, just to give a kind of a detailed example of how this works. For parsing, we want to analyze an input sequence that's our source code program. We want to determine the structure of the statements in that source code. We want to figure out what the programmer wrote. And we want to do it according to the rules for a language. In other words, we're looking for patterns inside of the source code. And to a Perl programmer, pattern means regular expression. And part of the genius of the language that Larry Wall, Damian Conway, and others have designed is that this is a language that is infinitely suitable for writing compilers, as you will see. So, 
what happens is the Parrot compiler toolkit uses Perl 6 regular expressions and grammars for parsers instead of tools like Lex and Yak. Here's an example. Let's say that we have a language where this is a valid source statement. If some sort of condition, then in a statement. Okay? We want to, when we're parsing, when we're looking at the source code, when a compiler is looking at the source code, we want to break it out into its various parts. An if keyword, an expression, a then keyword, and a statement. Okay, so from that, the general pattern for an if statement is if expression, then statement. If you've gone through various compiler design courses, then you know that we have this thing called uh, BNF grammars. And as a BNF grammar, you might write it this way. If statement is the Keyword if followed by an expression followed by a statement. In Perl 6, you would write it like this. Rule if statement is the keyword if followed by an expression followed by a keyword then followed by a statement. That's it. That writes the parser for the if statement. Um, let me give an example of what a more complete grammar looks like just briefly so you can see it. So this is a, a grammar for a version of the BC compiler um, from the BC tool in Unix. So you can see there's a rule for the top. There's a rule for a statement list. It consists of a statement followed by a semicolon and more statements. Um, a statement can be any of an if statement, a while statement, a for statement, a compound statement, or a string or an expression. There's what an if statement looks like. There's what a while statement looks like. It's the keyword while followed by a keyword, followed by a token of a parenthesis, followed by an expression, followed by a closed parenthesis, followed by a statement. You can just read that, right? That's what the language looks like. So when you're done, what happens is you can take a program. Now, again, this is a version of BC, which is a calculator. So it can take an expression like 3 plus 4, and it produces a parts tree. And this is actually what the compiler toolkit does for you. Once you write the, the, the grammar, you automatically get the parser. And it automatically produces a parse tree for you. Once you have a parse tree, we want to convert it to something called an abstract syntax tree. And these are the things that represent the operations and the things that a program is supposed to do. So um, the compiler toolkit provides these generic uh, abstract syntax tree nodes. Um, so to see what the abstract syntax tree representation of an if statement would be, we need to create a past op node, set its type to be if, set its first child as the condition, set the second child as the thing to do if the condition is true. In Perl 6, we'd write it like this. This is the transformation for a um, if statement. So here we say we want to create a new past op node. The first child is of uh, the abstract syntax tree of an expression, the second one is of the statement, and it's an if statement, and we're done. That's what our transformations look like for the compiler. Then we have the special purpose com uh, HLL compiler class. It provides us lots of options for debugging and helping to build the compiler. And to get an idea of how effective all of this is, in 2007, I attended PyCon, the Python conference in Dallas, Texas. It was uh, seven miles from where I live, so I figured I had to go. I figured as long as I was going to the conference, I might as well be a speaker at the conference. Try being a Perl speaker at a Python conference. <laughs> but I wanted to go and talk about Parrot. So I went and talked about Parrot and about the Python effort on Parrot. So I put in my proposal and said, I'm going to present the Python compiler on Parrot. And one thing led to another. And the night before my talk was due, I still hadn't written the compiler. I actually hadn't started it yet. And I've never written a line of Python code in my life. So the night before, I said, I better get started. And in six hours, I was able to write a working compiler using these tools, going straight from the language spec to having something that I could demonstrate at the Python conference and people applauded. Right? It was like, that's an amazing tool set. Now, that's not just you know my great programming ability. That's how advanced the concepts are that are going into Perl 6 and the tools that these other people have designed. It's really amazing. Another example is LOL code. How many of you have seen LOL code before? It's incredibly funny, right? All right. Um, 
Simon Cozens and Will Colita, having never used the Parrot compiler toolkit before, wrote an implementation of LOL code in, in four hours. So four hours they went from not really knowing much about the toolkit to actually having a basic LOL, compiler, LOL code compiler that worked, ran, did variables, did expressions, and did stuff like that. These are really powerful tools. Okay? As Simon Cozen said, it's really, really true. Parrot lets you implement your own languages using Perl 6 rules for the grammar and Perl 6 for the compiler. Um, the compiler tools also support uh, bottom-up um, compilation. I don't have much time, so I'll skip it. Okay, Rakuto Perl. In Perl 6, we're reserving the name Perl 6 to mean the language only. It never refers to a specific implementation. And so um, Perl 6 on Parrot has got the name Rakuto Perl. Rakuto is short for Rakudado, which means way of the camel. It also means paradise in Japanese. Isn't that nice? So Rakudo is paradise. <laughs> That's what we're aiming for here. Things that work in Rakudo, basic expression as of today, basic expressions and operators, scalars, arrays, hashes, a lot of the standard Perl, six, Perl things that you expect to be there. Other things that exist and work, classes, roles, and objects. We can do regular expressions using the Perl 6 syntax. Um, try blocks, that's for exception handling. Um, lexical and package scope variables begin and end blocks. Junctions work. Um, variety of, of things have been uh, put together that actually work. Some things that we fake, there's a few things that we don't quite handle yet. We don't handle list context because Larry hadn't defined it how it was supposed to work until three weeks ago. Um, so we're about to do that. Um, types is kind of fake. So there's, there's a few things that we fudge in there. But for the most part, it's a working Perl 6 compiler. If you want to get it yourself, um, you can check it out from the SDN repository. Building it is pretty straightforward. Just uh, get a copy of it, go to the Parrot directory, run configure, run make, make Perl 6, you get a Perl 6 binary. Okay, why has Perl 6 taken so long to develop? I only need about one more minute. Um, part of the reason is Perl 6 is extremely ambitious. If you go and look at everything that's going into this language, it's huge. In 2004 when I started, people would say, people were legitimately questioning whether we had designed a language that could not be implemented. Um, and I even wondered, which is why I wanted to try it. And um, um, I'm convinced it can be implemented now because we're doing it and all of the different features I think can be done, but a lot of them take a lot of time to put together. Um, the design took longer than expected. The language is constantly evolving and people say, no, we should pick a spec and stick with it and get it done. But I disagree because the w things that are changing in the language now are changing because we're finding problems as we're doing the implementation. And so we need to improve that. Um, not only that, but the scope has gone beyond just Perl 6. We're looking at a full multi-language environment for things like um, Parrot. And the reason why it took so long is it took time to develop the tools that would let us create Perl 6. And that's really happened here. Um, there's an increasing development curve now. Parrot releases are monthly. If you go and look, people say, oh, Parrot and Perl 6 are dead. They're not dead by any stretch of the imagination. For the last year and a half, we've been doing monthly releases every third Tuesday of the month, except when I do it, it ends up being the third Wednesday because I'm a procrastinator. Um, um, the Parrot object model finally got implemented in November of 2007. The compiler toolkit followed right after that in December 2007. Everything else has been increasing since then. I have a quick, oh no, I lost my, my picture, so I'll skip it. If you want to learn more about Perl 6, the main wiki site is here. You can, of course, do a Google search for Perl 6 and it'll take you to the right places to begin with. There are a number of mailing lists that you can join if you want to become an active developer. You can focus on the compiler, on Parrot development, on languages. Um, most of the Perl 6 people tend to hang out on IRC. Uh, those are very active channels. Um, you can either join channel Parrot on irc.perl.org or Perl 6 on irc.freedom.net. So in conclusion, Perl 6 is a substantial redesign and improvement of the Perl language. I think you can see some of that here. When people think of Perl 6 as being an incremental improvement, I say, no, it's really kind of a new language. It's still Perl, but it's really a new language, and it's a much better language. Everybody I know who has written programs in Perl 6 doesn't want to go back to Perl 5, which is the way I felt when I started writing programs in Perl. I didn't want to go back to C or Java or COBOL or anything like that. Um, Perl 6 exists today in a variety of implementations at various levels of completion, but there's enough to play with. There's nothing that's production ready yet. I suspect that'll happen within the year. Uh, Parrot is an incredible machine for dynamic languages. 
and the compiler toolkit is improving the development of all languages. So with that, how, how much time do I get for questions? Okay, question right here. That's good. Uh, uh, so what you said so far is that the tilde operator is tilde tilde. Yes. And yes. Uh, what about the compatibility with the older code? With older Perl 5 programs? Uh, the way that that's going to be handled, the question is what do we do about compatibility with Perl 5 programs? What we're going to do is actually embed Perl 5 as Perl, part of Parrot. And so when the compiler is scanning the program, it will look for something that says this is definitely a Perl 6 program. And if it sees it, then it will go do a Perl 6 compilation. Otherwise, it will go do a Perl 5 compilation and it will access it that way. I have another question up front. One of, um, one of my primary worries about Perl 6 had been, because it's been in development for so long, um, although it's, a, as you say, an ambitious language, it's not necessarily that ambitious because there's nothing that Perl 6 does that, for example, Haskell hasn't been doing in recent years and a number of other functional languages. Do you think that maybe Perl 6 has now missed its window of opportunity? Okay, so the question is, has Perl 6 missed its window of opportunity? Um, it's a legitimate question. And I, I personally, I think no. A lot of people say that it may have missed its window of opportunity. However, let me pose it in this particular way. Let's suppose that there was a brand new scripting language that came out that had all of these features but wasn't called Perl. Would people be interested in it? And the answer is probably yes. And the proof of that is that we still see new languages popping up, such as Ruby and other things that have come about, that there are features that appear in other languages that we would like for Perl to have as well, and yet we don't say that all scripting language development should stop. So if you think of Perl as Perl 6 as being really kind of a new language that uses a lot of the things that we're familiar with, then in that sense, we haven't missed our window of opportunity. It, it, it's a legitimate competitor in the scripting marketplace. And I think per, my personal feeling is that it is such an improvement in terms of the totality of things that it incorporates that it'll be the, the standard for a long time to come. I think I'm about out of time. Thank you very much.